Thank you, guys. City Line, it is so, so good to be with you this morning. Um, I want to just start by sharing something. Uh, I, like, actually really, really, really love your pastor, Mohan. Uh, I've met him for the first time. I've got some dear family friends. I actually go to church right here. Uh, it was their wedding, Persis and Ubby. I think I see them. There they are. Okay. Uh, their parents are on the back over there. Auntie, uncle, I see you there as well. All right. Uh, like close family friends. Like we grew up together. And so I remember there's this Pastor Mohan and, uh, and, and Persis was like, Joe, you really have to meet him. Like he's so awesome. And I was like, okay, like we'll see. And, and I sat down with him. And you, know, you know what I found out? He actually is awesome. <laughs> Like, he's cool, he's funny, he's relatable, he likes motorcycles, you know? You're like, all right, I, I, I love this guy. And then over the series of some, uh, some time, we actually realized that we have some uh, friends in common in ministry. And so uh, when I got the opportunity to come here and to share, uh, I was just absolutely ecstatic. And it's truly, truly an honor for me to be here with y'all. Uh, so I serve uh, at Proverbs 31 Ministries. I'm a theologian. I, I try to teach the Bible, and, and I'm a Bible nerd. You're going to get some of that from me. But uh, I found this kind of conviction, and, and this is my, my basic belief, that, that God cares a lot about our sanctification. Okay, wow, y'all are like already Bible scholars and theologians in here. Like, let's go, Pastor Mullen. All right. Uh, so sanctification, I want to just define my terms. Sanctification is simply the process by which we are becoming like Jesus, right? It sounds simple, but it's kind of far from being simplistic. Let me define it this way. Um, the goal is Jesus, he's the goal, and our aim is to become like the one that we're looking at. Uh, sanctification in my life kind of works out a couple different ways. My wife, Brittany, and I have been married now for about 15 years. Uh, we've got four children, three boys, Liam, Levi, Lucas, 13, 12, and 10. And y'all, four years ago, on Valentine's Day, we welcomed our baby girl, Amelia Jane. I nicknamed her MJ after the greatest basketball player of all time. If you know, you know. <laughs> so let's go right? Uh, so this was some, um, some years ago. Uh, you know, my wife, she was kind of on this health kick. And so um, she was like, mm, hey, babe, have you heard of this thing called Whole30? Anybody heard of Whole30? Yeah, it is not from heaven. Let me just tell you that. <laughs> She'd be like, I care about your health. I'm like, that's sanctification. That's hard. Or, or here's another one. Oh, by the way, I'm Indian. Did you know that? Okay. Important detail here. My wife is white. I'm Indian. Uh, and so she came up to me once and she was like, hey, babe, I, I really care about your health. Uh, I really think that we should start eating this thing called cauliflower rice. I was like, that is offensive to us. We don't do that. These are some funny examples, but... Um, we know that sanctification is also kind of serious, right? And so um, sanctification takes place in our marriage. Can anybody say amen? amen. Yeah. Sanctification happens uh, as we're trying to raise children. Uh, now I don't even have to ask for the amen, right? <laughs> Whew. This was some uh, years ago. We actually lived right here in this area in Naperville for just a couple of years. Um, and we now live in Charlotte, North Carolina. But, but those years ago, uh, my mom lived in Indianapolis. And at this point, our boys were seven, five, and um, nine months old. Lukey was kind of just born. And I had this thought. It was my mom's birthday. And I was like, you know what? We're going to surprise my mom for her birthday. It's going to be awesome. We're just going to do a little road trip. Like, it's going to be about three hours to, to get to Indianapolis. And, and we have these three boys. And, and y'all, like, we feel like we are pro-parents, right? Like, we know how to do road trips. And, and so some of you are laughing already. You're like, yes. So we're like, okay, here's the, the first detail. Three hours. Um, we want to be in our budget, right? So it's like we're going to eat at home before we go on the road trip. Perfect. Now, we know that the most crucial detail is right here. We line up all of the children, we look at the boys, and we say, before we get into this minivan, boys, have you gone to the? Oh my gosh, y'all are pro-parents too. This is amazing. Exactly. Right around this time, my friends, Shane and Shane, they had just released Psalms Volume 2, an album that kind of works through the Psalms. And one of my favorite songs on that album is Psalm 46. It's got like this, this epic refrain, and, and it simply says this, the, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. 
I get a bit obsessive about songs, and so in my mind, I'm thinking, all right, this is going to be great. We're going to get into the minivan. We're going to drive three hours, and I'm going to have Psalm 46 on repeat for all three hours. My wife looked at me, and she just simply said no. So I got, okay, I'm going to got six, a six repeat rule, you know, kind of like the bulls. They, you know, repeat the three-peat, that whole deal. So we're trying to keep it all Chicago around here. And so it's like, okay. We're going to repeat these, and, and we get into the, into the minivan, and, and I put it into my GPS, and um, in my phone, it, it says, uh, time to destination, estimated arrival, is three hours. You all know, like, when you do a road trip, it, it kind of feels something like this. It's like, okay, you get off of the exit, you're, you're on the highway, and it feels like, okay, feel the rhythm, feel the rhyme, it's road trip time. <laughs> and then um, all of a sudden, I hear a little voice from behind me, and it says, hey, Dad, to which I think, ignore it, and it will go away. (laughs) And about 30 seconds later, it's like, hey, Dada, which point I look at my wife, and she looks at me, and I look at her, and I'm like, you will not be the weak link. Ignore it, and it will go away. (laughs) And about 10 seconds later, hey, Daddy, and I'm like, no, not the Daddy, and I turn around, and I look at one of my sons, and, and it's Levi, and he's, he's like, hey, Dad, mm, uh, mm, mm. I kind of have to go to the Y'all, what in the world? So we know, like, hey, you can't just get off at any exit. You got to do a rest stop, right? And, and it's like, okay, we can do the math, the math be math, and like five minutes off, five minutes back on, 10 minutes max. I know I'm Indian. We're supposed to be really good at math. It skipped a generation for me. (laughs) But even I can do this. This is the wildest thing happened. Five minutes off, five minutes back on. We get back. My phone, it started to recalculate. Why do you need to recalculate? Then it had the audacity to recalculate and say, estimated time of arrival, three hours, 45 minutes. I know, we laugh because otherwise we'd just start crying. <laughs> okay, um, what happened? I had an unexpected detour in my life. And that unexpected detour created an unwanted delay. And this unwanted delay has me feeling all kinds of denials in my life. This is a funny story. But it is not beyond me to think that some of you have woken up and rolled into church this morning with a smile on your face, and yet you are carrying a heavy hurt in your human heart. And you have experienced a detour that has absolutely blindsided you. And this detour has created an absolutely unwanted delay And now you feel like you're living in the midst of denial. And if we're just going to be really honest with each other, we even have this thought, maybe this denial is actually a denial that came from God. Friends, I want to encourage you with just a little bit of gospel hope this morning. The detours and the delays of our life are not evidence of God's denial. No. In fact, they are a divine redirection wrapped up in a peculiar package of grace. Uh, One of the little details I forgot to mention in my story is that my nine-month-old son, Lucas, when I put him into his car seat, he felt a bit warm to the touch. Now, y'all know babies. Babies are a bit warm. They get little fevers, low grade, no big deal. I will never forget the day. It's a Friday. We're getting off of the exit after three hours and 30 minutes. And um, Lukey started to cry. And my wife has like, you know, that mom, Holy Spirit instinct. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. And it's like there's different levels of crying. And, and Lukey started to cry. And, and then all of a sudden the, the cry um, moved up just a little bit. And, and now we knew, wait a minute, there's something wrong. And, and she just knew instantly something is. And, and she unbuckled and she jumped into the middle seat. And, and all of a sudden we just heard a shriek and silence. And she started to scream. My family calls me Joey. She just started saying, Joey, Joey, call 911. Luke's non-responsive. 
Y'all ever have a moment when life is speeding up, but then simultaneously slowing down? I remember pulling into, um, it was a steakhouse, and it was totally full. It's like a Friday night. Didn't have enough place for me to pull my car into. So I just stopped in the middle there and was on the phone with 911. And I won't ever forget the operator just saying to me, sir, hold on, help is on the way. I opened the side door and I took my nine-month-old son out and and y'all know, like, as parents, like, our singular responsibility is for the protection and care for our children. And here I am, thinking up until this moment, I had it all under control. And in this moment, I came to the conclusion that the thought that we could actually have control is nothing but an illusion. And he was as hot as a fireball in my, in my hand and... And the most incredible thing happened in this moment. Remember I said that I was obsessed with Psalm 46? You see, the Lord, um, he met me in this moment. We began to have an intimate and yet very precise dialogue that took place. I ended up putting it and writing it down in my journal, and it made its way into my book, The Hidden Peace. And I just want to read a journal entry to you from, from this moment and this is just what I said. I said, it's so hard to describe what took place in the next moments. It was a raw and intimate conversation with God within my heart that went something like this. God, I can't control what's happening right now. I feel like everything is falling apart and there's nothing that I can do about it. And God replied, the Lord of hosts is with you. I said, God, every ounce of strength I thought I had had been depleted. I'm weak and I'm panicked. And I don't know how I can do this. And God replied, the Lord of hosts is with you. I said, God, every ounce of strength I thought I had is, is gone. I feel powerless and empty and everyone's looking at me to do something, but I'm completely at a loss. And God replied, the Lord of hosts is with you. And then finally, I just simply said, God, I believe you. You're here. And you can handle this. You see, in those panic moments, the primary thing my heart needed to be reminded of was the eternal truth of God's nearness to me. The unshakable reality of the presence of God within me. This anthem of truth, the Lord of hosts is with me, led me to face the crippling fear and pain of my heart. We ended up finding out that what Luke had is what's referred to as a febrile seizure. He had a double ear infection, and, and a febrile seizure happens when the temperature rises too fast and, and gets, gets hot. And in and, and honest transparency, for the next four and a half years, Luke had about 40 seizures. And, and, and every time that happened, like, like we were panicked and we were triggered and, and we felt out of control. And yet, we just were met with this anthem of truth and, and not in spite of, but in the very midst of, the Lord of hosts is with you. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. We're so grateful um, Luke grew out of the febrile seizures, and he's been seizure-free for almost six and a half years. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but something really funny happened just like a month ago. Luke had a fever. You know what happened to me? I got triggered. Do y'all know what triggers are? Yeah? You ever wonder, wouldn't it be so nice if we could just time our triggers? We could just schedule when we're going to have our triggers, right? Like, it's convenient for me on a Friday night at maybe 4 p.m. for me to have this trigger at this time. But that's not how triggers work. They just happen. And when Luke had a fever and I got triggered, what I needed to be reminded of was... This anthem of truth of Psalm 46. I want us to turn to Psalm 46 together. If you've got your Bibles, uh, we can jump there because I think that there is an immense amount of hope that is present for us in Psalm 46. Um, Psalm, the book of Psalms is right in the middle of your Bible, so you can kind of just guess and open up to the middle and, and get there. If you've got an iPhone, you'll get there instantly. If you have an Android device, I'm so sorry. 
Remember, I said sanctification is a process and God's working. <laughs> Believe it. Psalm 46, all 11 verses. If I were to write a commentary on Psalm 46, I, I, I would just maybe skip all the commentary notes and I would just headline it this one simple way. God is in control. I mean, that's it. God is in control. To say God is in control has an implication. There's a consequence to this statement. What is it? To say God is in control means that other people are not. To say God is in control means that no matter how much money and wealth millionaires and billionaires have, they are not in control. God is in control. Uh, this means that um, no matter how much our, our, our governments and politicians, and, and they're like, yo, we got this under control. They are not in control. God is in control. And listen, this also means that no matter how much power and strength and ability that you and I have, we are not in control. God is in control. This is how the psalmist lays it out. 11 verses, all words and syllables and punctuation marks emphasizing this idea. God is in control. Verses 1 through 3, it's letting us know God is in control over all of nature. Verses 4 through 7, it lets us know God is in control over our enemies. And just in case you're like, wait, is anything missing? Don't you worry. The psalmist got you. Verses 8 through 11, God is in control over the entire world. Let's work through the text together. It starts this way, that the God is our refuge and strength. A helper, the Hebrew word here is, is air. It's actually the exact same word that's used of um, Eve, who is the helper to Adam. It's the same Hebrew word that's actually used all throughout the Old Testament to describe God, who is a king, and he comes to the aid of Israel when they are helpless. So this is who is our helper, this cosmic king of heaven. He is our helper who is sometimes found. He is our helper who, if A plus B equals, then he's found. No. Uh, he is our helper who is always found in times of trouble. And then it says this, therefore, Bible reading pro tip. Every time there's a therefore in the Bible, it is there for a reason. Therefore, in light of this truth, that, that God is our refuge, that he is our strength, that when, when times are, are troubling, in light of this, this aspect, we will not be afraid. And then this is kind of epic. The psalmist gives us three images. This is what he says. Though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the seas, though its water roars and foams and the mountains quake with turmoil... One of the things that happens to us when we're reading the Bible is like, we're so fast. We're like, speed read, get to the good stuff. Okay, great. Let's move on. I want to encourage us for just a moment to slow down. Every detail of the text is important. And what the psalmist does here is he gives us three images. And, and in the context of the ancient Near Eastern world, the, the time of the Old Testament these images mattered. The first image is the image of mountains. Like today, you and I, we're like, oh, cool. Like we can um, go on a hike on a mountain, right? It's like maybe we'll get to the top of the mountain and we'll take a selfie with our phone, preferably an iPhone. <laughs> and we'll post it onto our Instagram and, and people will like and, and good, beautiful, nice mountains. In the ancient world, mountains had a specific idea, and that idea was total power, strength, and control. The mountains were unshakable. They were unmovable. Like, like the mountains were the picture, perfect image of power. The second image is the image of the sea. Once again, you and I, we're like, oh, the sea. It might be a, a good idea to do a boat trip, a day on the lake, right? Or some of you are like, y'all are, are beach people. Right? You're like, oh, the sun's out. Like, let's go to the beach by the water and, and let's lay out and, and let's get a tan. Well, at least some of you, I'm good if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> In the ancient world, the sea was an image of chaos and destruction. 
Ain't nobody trying to go out to the sea to have a fun day. The, the sea, don't you know, it's the place where the sea dragon, the Leviathan lives. Can you imagine being an ancient Israelite and you hear this, the ultimate picture of power and strength collapsing into the total picture of chaos and destruction. This isn't just bad news. This is apocalyptically horrific news. I don't know if you um, see this, but in your Bibles, there's this little word, and it said Selah. Y'all see that? Yeah, okay. Um, the Selah, it's a musical note, and it's intended to cause us to pause. Can you feel the stress? Right? Oh no, did you forget a spot? Was there a slide that was supposed to come? Did the mic get cut out? Oh no! We live in a society that is so eager to get to the destination. We were so consumed with getting to that final place of destination. It doesn't matter the cost. We just need to get there. But I'm super terrified that we get there when we look at ourselves. And we don't even like who we are and who we become once we get there. The psalmist wants us to slow down. To truly consider the consequence of the chaos and the hardship and the hurt that is in our world. It's not a bad thing to acknowledge those things. It's a very human thing. But the Selah is not a period where we stop. It's a pause where we breathe so we can move on. Look at this next line. Verse 4. And there is a river. Can you feel the exhale? <sighs> the river in the ancient world, it, it always communicated peace and tranquility and life and shalom. There's a river and its streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. Well, what makes this place so magnificent? God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns, nations rage, and kingdoms topple. The earth melts when he lifts his voice. This entire psalm hinges on verses 7 through 8. If you pulled verses 7 through 8 out of the psalm, the entire psalm collapses on itself. The pivot point of this psalm is verses 7 and 8. Well, what is verses 7 and 8? Look at this. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Now, detail. There's that Selah again. If you ever wondered, why is there a Selah right here? Why not just get to the next part? I think it's because the psalmist acknowledges that there are some skeptics and critics. And there may be some skeptics and critics right here in this room. You might be like, yeah, 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 the Lord of hosts is with them. <laughs> He's with them. Everything's going well with them. Their kids are all great. Their life is all great. Their finances are, yeah, yeah, the Lord of hosts is with them. The Lord of hosts is with them. They got it together. The Lord of hosts is with them. They had a rocky road, but look at them now. They're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Lord of hosts with them and them and them, but he ain't with me. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know the pain that I'm feeling. You don't know the loss that I've experienced. Say la. It's almost as if the psalmist is like, come on with it. Come on, let it all out. And then, this is the invitation that the psalmist gives to them and he's giving to us today. The invitation is, come on. The Hebrew here, it has in mind, behold. Pay attention. Take a look at. Be observant. Come and see the works of the Lord. Um, the invitation of Psalm 46, 7, and 8 
is an invitation to accept our limits, to be okay with our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities. Because we know in that moment, we behold the greatness of God. We can receive this infinite truth that the Lord of hosts is with us. When I am holding my nine-month-old son, I never had the assurance that everything was going to be okay. I, I, I didn't. The assurance that I got was the one that I needed. And what I needed to know is that in this moment of my weakness and my vulnerability and an acknowledgement of my limits, I become aware of the Lord of hosts who is with me, the God of Jacob who is my stronghold. In the presence of my limits is where I become aware of the limitless ability of God. At this point, some of you are like, cool, but Joel, are you going to proof text? Just go from one place in Psalm 46. Is it the only place where you get this idea? Because miss me with that. I don't believe, right? I got you. Don't you worry. Actually, the apostle Paul has you. Let's turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, um, uh, Paul is in this place. It's called the Areopagus. Specifically in a place called Mars Hill. And, and this place is a place where deep thinkers like to think deep thoughts. They're asking questions like, why is it that bad things happen to good and humble people? Why is it that there is evil in this world? And, and why is it it seems like nothing is being done about this? Like, like this is the type of conversation. These are the types of things that are taking place in this place called Mars Hill. And, and Paul walks up into this place. And, and again, he gives them not what they want, but what they need. Some of you are like, Joel, um, we don't have any Mars Hill around here. There ain't no Areopagus around here. To which point I'd be like, yes, you're right. But you know what you guys have everywhere? Coffee shops. <laughs> One of the things I love to do when I travel is um, I love to find local coffee shops. And, and I'll typically roll in with my theology books and my headphones. And, and if you saw me at a local coffee shop, you'd probably be thinking, oh, wow, he's about to do some deep theology research. And, and I just am committed to honesty at all costs, so I'm just going to have a vulnerable moment with all of you, my closest friends now here. When I'm walking in, I will get to theology, but before I do that and I sit down next to you as you all are talking, I'm listening to you. I'm listening to your conversations. I know, you're like, was he supposed to say that? Well, I did, so... Sometimes this is what I hear. A group of girlfriends who are like, um, man, he promised that, that he wouldn't lie anymore. And then I caught another lie. And now I cannot figure out what the truths are and what the lies are. Or it might be a group of friends who have... Um, Somebody that they've kind of just grown up with their whole life, you know, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a dear friend, and, and yet addiction has just absolutely robbed them. And it's like they might have had a season of sobriety and everything is going well, and then all of a sudden they don't just fall off the rails, the rails collapse underneath them and they're just gone. And you're trying to like, like, how did that happen? Or sometimes it's parents who are sitting together and and they're like, like, we have raised our children to love Jesus, to have deep affection for him. We, we raised them inside of the church so, so they would grow up to be um, just marveled at King Jesus. And, and now they're adults and they're making decisions that are absolutely incongruent with the way that we've raised them. And we cannot make sense of any of this. Like, what, what is going on? How do I process this? In Acts chapter 17, Paul addresses every one of these issues, not with what we want, but with what we need. This is what he says in verse 26. He starts this way. He says, from one man, he has made every nationality, the ethnos of the world, to live over the whole earth and catch the details of the text. He has determined their appointed times, and the boundaries of where they live. And he did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far 
from each one of us. They'll catch that. Like you realize, you could live in any geographical area, anywhere, and yet you live in your neighborhood, on your street, it's your workplace, your cubicle. Like, like this is not random and it is not by chance. God has a reason and a purpose for you there. He has determined the boundaries of your existence. You realize you could have been born in any time in human history? Like any time. And yet, you live and you breathe in this moment of human history? This is not some kind of divine roll of the dice. There's a God who is sovereign and he has determined the times of your existence. And then when pain hits us, and when heartache strikes, we wonder why. And we begin to think, well, where's God? Did you catch what he just said right here? Not only has God determined the boundaries of your existence and the, a lot of times of when you breathe, but it's in that moment that you might reach out, the Greek word here, it's used all throughout Greek literature by Homer and the Iliad and other places to describe a person who's trapped in darkness. What is the condition of a person who's trapped in darkness? Are they at the height of their strength? Are they at the max of their ability? Nah. They're experiencing weakness and vulnerability. There's probably some panic. And there's this desire, like, I gotta get out. It's in this moment when you're trapped in darkness and, and you begin to reach to try to get yourself out that all of a sudden in this position of weakness and vulnerability that you reach out and all of a sudden you feel the faithful and firm and nail-pierced hands of Jesus himself. And then you're like, oh my gosh, he's actually never been far from any one of us. He's been there the whole time. The Lord of hosts is with us. Amen. The God of Jacob Amen. is our stronghold. Amen. Some of you, um, there's a little bit of frustration, and I understand it because I feel it. Um, the commonality between Psalm 46 and my moment of weakness and vulnerability in Acts chapter 17, in this moment when you're trapped in darkness, the commonality in both situations and circumstances is the presence of weakness and vulnerability. And what we want, typically, is we want answers to all of the pain and misery and confusion of our life. That's what we're seeking God for. Can we just be honest for a second? Just Tell me why. And yet, consistently throughout Scripture, especially in the book of Job, every time we're asking why, 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 God responds with who, who, who. Now, we're like, that doesn't help us, but I actually think it does. There was an ancient philosopher who once said, the more money, the more problems. I have a belief that um, actually the more questions and the more answers, the more questions. It's an endless spiral because we do not have infinite capacity to understand all of the complexity of the human world. Only God does. And if God is the one who knows it all and holds it all together, then the infinitely more powerful proposition for us today, for, for us to have, is not the answers, but the God who holds all the answers. Yeah. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. The common posture that we get to in both of these moments, especially, primarily, when it comes to weakness and vulnerability and, and limits and inability, 
is an ancient virtue that for far too long has been neglected in our culture and our society today. It's not just neglected, it's rejected. And yet, it just happens to be the very thing that Jesus himself embodies in the incarnation When the blessing of heaven comes to earth, takes on human flesh, journeys to the cross, defeats death through death, and then invites all of us into his beautiful kingdom. This ancient virtue is a Greek word called tapianos. And and if you were in the Greco-Roman world right now and you heard that, everybody would gasp. It would be the equivalent of somebody walking in here with the scarlet letter. Tapianos is a word that we would translate in English as humility. Ephesians chapter 2, that we're to adopt the likeness and the image of Christ who became humble. You see, humility is this incredible gift for us because humility helps us not to be defeated by our weakness and vulnerability and limits. No, humility helps us to get through it so we can recognize and see the infinite one, Jesus himself, who is with us in the midst of all of that. But what is humility? Uh, C.S. Lewis is historically attributed for this epic definition. It it simply says, um, he said, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less often. Side note, incredibly dangerous to disagree with C.S. Lewis, right? So I won't disagree with Lewis, but I will suggest this, that biblical humility has an order, and the order actually doesn't start with the self. You see, humility first and foremost starts with an awareness of God. Because if I know who God is, I now know who I am. And if I know who God is, and now I know who I am, I can now rightly know and relate to other image bearers of God. Humility goes sideways and pride steps in when the order is messed up. And, And instead of thinking God, me, others, we think me, myself, and I. I call it the unholy trinity. And the anthem of this unholy trinity, of me, myself, and I, as the kids might say it is, you do you, boo. (laughs) If we live a life of you do whatever you want that makes you happy, that makes you successful, forget other people. In fact, only care about other people as long as they are going to benefit you, lift you up, make you successful. In other words, people are pawns on a chessboard that you're happy to sacrifice for your own good. If you live this kind of lifestyle, if you live with this kind of ethos, this kind of lens, the end of it is not success, it is not stability, it is not control, it is exhaustion and anxiety and loneliness. And God wants none of that for you. Instead, when we live the humble life of Christ and we recognize who God is, when we write, like, like God is the God of peace. And this God of peace, he pours out his peace onto us. And it's the kind of peace that cannot be stripped or snatched away by our situations, our conditions. It's the kind of peace that is with us, not in the absence of hard and hurtful things, but in the very presence of those kinds of things. The peace of God flowing into the people of God so that we could be agents of that peace into a broken world that is desperate to experience that themselves. Humility is such a significant gift because humility, it helps us to get through. I believe that the most important preposition of the Bible is the preposition through. It was necessary for the Israelites to go through the wilderness so they could experience the provision of God. It was necessary for the Israelites to go through the Red Sea so they could experience and witness the power of God. It was necessary for Jesus to go through Samaria so he could meet a Samaritan woman hiding in the middle of the day in in the heat because she was an outcast so that she could experience the presence of God. Do you notice the commonality with all three of those stories? The Red Sea, the wilderness, and the woman in Samaria? Weakness, vulnerability, inability. 
when the Israelites were terrified for their lives and they hear the hooves of the Egyptians behind them and the sea in front of them, which by the way is what? An image of death? (laughs) And then God parts the Red Sea? Are you even kidding me right now? This is better than any Marvel movie. In fact, they're ripping off the biblical narrative anyways. The people in the wilderness, and they got food, and they're, and they're hungry, and all of a sudden, they look up into heaven, and all of a sudden, bread comes down from heaven. It's like, are we being serious right now? Jesus, the bread of life, coming down from heaven? A Samaritan woman who is the outcast of her society, who feels like she doesn't belong anywhere, and, and here comes the incarnate son of God? In her loneliness, she experiences the presence of God himself? Like, are we serious right now? Humility, humility, humility. The humility of Christ that led him to the cross so that you and I today might be recipients of his power and his presence and his provision. There's no greater hope for you and I than this simple anthem, Psalm 46. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are with us, that you were here before, that you are here now, and you will be here forever, that your wisdom knows no ends and your power has no limits, that in the midst of all of our inability, that you are the one who is truly able. So God, we pray that in our moments of helplessness and hopelessness, that we would just meditate on this truth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold.